Right, so yeah, this is growing TypeScript and Rust. We're talking not so much about the technology, so this kind of a, are you in the right room check um, or watching the right video online. Instead, we're talking about how to grow an open source project. Um, when I started on TypeScript, it was very small and we helped grow it to a much larger project. And in this talk, I'm talking about how we did that. Uh, you don't have to be working on your own programming language that you wanna grow to get something out of this talk. My hope is that these are really general principles for growing open source projects and that they can kind of transfer from the programming language domain to yours. I was describing this talk to a friend of mine and he said, you know, you could have called it, you could have called it how we convince Microsoft to go open source, which is uh, also something I'll be talking about in this talk as well. So if you wanted some of the historical background about how Microsoft shifted to being more open source friendly, I'll talk about that. A little bit about me, uh, my name is Jonathan Turner. I was the program manager at Microsoft on the TypeScript team from its nascent baby days through to um, its colossal growth with things like adopting Angular, which is a really popular JavaScript framework. After that, I left uh, TypeScript. I was like, that's cool. I will never touch another programming language again. Uh, a month later, playing with Russ, I said, mm, I might have to change my mind about that. This is, uh, this is really cool. And sure enough, I started asking around. They were looking for someone that, did, that could do something similar with Rust that I did with TypeScript. So I joined and kind of carried that forward. So this talk will talk about the TypeScript years and then talk about what I learned in the Rust years as well. I'm still a Rust community team member, so I still contribute, I still run the survey. Um, so I still have a finger in uh, if you have any questions about that specifically. I was trying to think of like, what's my open source cred here for this, uh, this audience? My first Linux install was in 1996, Slackware, a stack of three and a half inch floppies. Anyone else do that? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm not alone. I almost didn't ask who else did that because you just, you don't want to date yourself too badly. All right, here's the equation we want to solve in general. And this equation we can kind of unpack for days. I'm gonna do my best to fit some good stuff in for the next 40 minutes. We have code. We can always grow our code to be more code. It can do more things. And we want to grow the project. But there's a, in between, there's kind of a, a, a little something that we need to do to help that code reach the audience, to help the contributors find this project. And that's, uh, again, what we'll be talking about. But before we kind of talk about why, I mean, before we talk about how to do it, let's talk a little bit about why. This might be obvious to a lot of you uh, because of the open source background. But, you know, if I'm just one person and I'm working on my little pet project and then I, you know, something happens, I get distracted. Then the project just languishes. So growing the support structure around the project allows it to have that longevity, allows it to kind of change and mature through time. It also allows us to mentor people. So Linux is a great example. People want to hack on the kernel. So they come, they have a bunch of experts sitting there that can teach them how to hack on the kernel. Great. We have a mentorship opportunity that new people come in, they can learn, and then pass it on to the next generation. Also, it's fun. I mean, this is like maybe a bit cheeky, but because it's fun to grow the project, it kind of gives us incentive to continue with it as well as the kind of creators of this project. We see people coming in with their enthusiasm, their new ideas, and we're like, you know what? That's a good idea, or I can do better than that, and it kind of creates this virtuous cycle. All right, so let's start, let's dive into part one, this TypeScript side. For those who um, remember Microsoft back in the day, the uh, Let's just call it uh, the assault on the open source community back in the 90s, let's be honest. Um, and then they had a period where they weren't quite as aggressive, but they would put stuff out into open source kind of in a fire and forget. They'd release it to open source, then they would take that team and then just move on, on to something else. So this is the history leading up to when TypeScript was open sourced. This was one of the first times that Microsoft was gonna put something into the open source have a team behind it that would continue to support it, so we're not just fire and forget, and then learn from how we're doing it. As you can imagine, this uh, landed like a Led Zeppelin with a lot of people. 
because of Microsoft's background with open source, and because TypeScript itself was a JavaScript tool, again, we ran into this, who, who are you, Microsoft? Like, we are JavaScript developers, we all use Macs, we don't need you. Um, so there's definitely a bit of butting heads. I'm gonna just take a quick pause and say a big thanks to the, the teams that we worked with, the mentors um, that, I, that I worked with to be able to do this. When I came into this, I was just a developer. I've been doing development for 10 plus years, but I'd never done any management, any thinking about the project at the project level. And so they did a, a lot to help me out. I found a picture of back in the day, you may recognize me, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in the middle. Um, you might also recognize the guy sitting beside me, which is Anders Helsberg, who invented Turbo Pascal, C Sharp, and then later would go on to help with the TypeScript project. So I don't know what I'm doing. I'm very nervous, and I'm trying to just see if we can figure out how to, how to help this thing grow. As you can tell, it was a small team, right? There is only that set of us in Microsoft um, and whoever we could convince outside of Microsoft to help pitch in on the project. We had a, arguably a good idea, right? Let's add some optional typing to JavaScript and see what happens as what you can do with tooling. You might not believe me, but we also had zero marketing budget. Uh, open source makes no money for Microsoft, it doesn't sell Visual Studio licenses. And so marketing looked at us and said, well, that's, that's nice, uh, have fun. If we ever have a requirement to promote TypeScript, we'll come back to you. So we had to do everything ourselves. We had to write blog posts, we had to get on Twitter, we had to get on you know, any social media we could that people would listen to us and tell our story over and over again. We also had to use this thing called CodePlex, just out of curiosity, has anyone ever heard of CodePlex before? Wow. Okay, for those who haven't seen this thing, that's CodePlex. So, as you can imagine, if Microsoft has a technology that um, is like GitHub, but not GitHub, and the VPs are very keen on us using it, then we use that. That's okay. At least TypeScript is going open, and we can reach potential users and potential contributors, even if it's through CodePlex. Um, Spoiler alert, we did get on GitHub later on. So I'm kind of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. I don't really know what I'm doing. We release into the public, and one of the first things that we realize as we get out into the public is everyone comes to it with their own set of ideas. Right? I want feature X. Oh, no, I want feature Y. Oh, okay, I want feature Z. Now you're going in three different directions. So we needed a way for people to, to check in and say, oh, well, where are you going? What's in our heads? Well, let's just write it down. We have a roadmap. We know generally what the next feature is gonna have, and maybe a vague idea about the feature after that, or the release after that. No problem. We'll put that in a roadmap, and then that will give people confidence as they come to the project what to do next. This might seem obvious in hindsight, but trust that we did not, uh, we did not think of that coming out of the gate for some reason or another. Another thing that we started doing is to use a Microsoft technique. So when you're sitting down with a group of engineers and you're trying to describe, you're trying to work through the design of feature X. And feature X, you do not want the whole hour taken up by their pet changes that they want to do. So we say, okay, our goals of this meeting, our goals of this design are these, and then our non-goals are all of these things it's not to say that we won't do them, we might do them later, but focus on the goals. We used a similar technique on the TypeScript team to get the, um, get the energies of the community focused on the goals that we wanted to go after and to kind of stop suggesting features in the non-goals. This is actually still up there. So when you uh, contribute a feature request to TypeScript, you say, uh, I have read the goals and non-goals document. And I, you, know, you don't have to necessarily read through these word for word, but you can get a general sense that there is kind of a thou shalt and thou shalt not kind of sense to them to help focus the energy of the, the contributions that we would get. Another lesson that we 
we kind of had a, a hunch for, but when you see it play out, it's, it's really striking. Um, I'm gonna give my really poor biology knowledge really quickly, and then people can correct me after. But <clears throat> with DNA, you have a blueprint, and that blueprint creates the proteins, and then there you go. That's how you create a, a system over time. The DNA for a project are the behaviors, the attitudes, the actions that the creators are taking. So if I create a project and I come in and I have a very calming, relaxed way that I respond to issues, then people will begin to pick up on that. And the next set of contributors see that, well, that's how that, the founder does it, so that's how we'll kind of do it. And they'll morph some of that into how they act. And this creates a, a culture that I would call the DNA, like each new generation of contributors that come and generation might be this week, this person is a junior and now they're senior and then you have the next junior um, that has never touched the project before. But they get to see each other. And so that um, uh, habits, the way that you respond, the focus, the attitude, all get reflected and then the people that stay reflect that to the next, the next set of people. And they also reflect what we'll call the vision. So what's the vision? As a, uh, as a creator of this project, we have a particular idea that we want to get forward. We have a, a vision, like we can kind of see over the hill of where this thing wants to go. With TypeScript, we, we say, well, if we can get more and more people contributing to it, we can get more and more functionality. If people will just add types to this library and this library, and then the next set of people will be able to use them. So if we have a, what we call like a, minimal, a memorable reason for being, that's something that might stick in your head. If you're at the AV1 talk, it might be um, next generation, uh, non, like, like a free next generation uh, AV codec. Okay, and then that sticks in the mind of the people that come to it and say, okay, I wanna work on a free next generation codec. That sounds great. And then that passes along. This becomes a rallying point. So you'll notice these themes pop up in Twitter. People will talk about, well, have you seen the next generation of AV codecs? And they will point at it. And lesson number five, this is where, okay, so those first four might be uh, somewhat obvious, um, depending on your background. But lesson five to me seemed like the most confusing of the set. We have a project. I've, I've written lots of code before, but I've never taken a project and said, how do we know that we're going in the right direction? How do we know that if I add this feature instead of this one, that that is the right direction for this project? And we had to learn that as we went. Uh, you can kind of think of users as, as the target. So you've got a bullseye set of users, and we'll call those the key users, or the stakeholders. And these users are really intimately involved with using your project. They have a lot of ideas, likely. Um, they're available for a deep dive, so that you can ask them a lot of questions and really get a sense for, like, how are they using it? These set of key users are also kind of indicative of the problems that some of the larger community is feeling. So if you have a, uh, like with TypeScript we had the Angular team, which is Angular being a JavaScript framework, we were watching how they would use it, or the Ember team would use it. They say, well, this is really cool, except there's this whole set of things that we can't type. Oh, well that's, that's interesting. Maybe we should work on that. And those key users then opened up new possibilities for users of TypeScript going forward. But not to be you know, forgotten, the fans of the project and the wider community are just as important as the key users. But the way that we work with them is different. So these are you know, obviously the largest part of our growth as the users would grow uh, in number would be in these, this wider community. So how would we get information from them well, we can't just sit down with every single 10,000 or 100,000 users and you know, get every single pain point they have. Well, we kind of can. 
it's in a different way. So we can do surveys. We can look through the issue tracker and find themes in the issue tracker. Well, that's pretty handy. Now if we have themes, we can say, well, if we address this theme, then that set of users that was affected by it, you know, their life gets a little bit better. And yeah, this kind of opens up more um, future exploration as well. Another kind of lesson that you can draw out of the same thing is that you may think this is where the target is. Well, it's obvious to you, this is clearly where the target is. And then your competition comes along and, and sees that you're starting to take off and they have a different set of ideas. With TypeScript, we had Facebook Flow. So Facebook had their own TypeScript-esque project and they came along and said, well, your target is not the right one. This target is. And we could look at that and we can see, well, are any users leaving us to go use them? Or, or are they getting users that are, that are just kind of choosing their features? How many, other, how many of those features can we take? Can we put into TypeScript? You know, can we fold some of that into what we do? So as another way to calibrate to see if you're going in the right direction, you can look at your user feedback, but the competition is also looking to perhaps capture users you don't have. So this information, like how we started growing TypeScript, and that was just kind of a small sample. Uh, it took far too long to kind of unpack all the, the, the kinds of things that we did. But as we started doing that, and as TypeScript started growing, that started a chain reaction. So projects would come to us and say, well, can you, can you teach us how to do open source? And we're like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can try. I can show you what we did. And it's kind of working, though I don't, there probably are better ways, but at least it's working. And so the .NET team came and we went and taught them and then, wow, C Sharp is open sourcing. Oh, okay, we'll teach them too. And other teams started coming and at some point it was like every week there was a team that wanted to do open source. So I left Microsoft in October of 2015. By the end of 2015, like only a couple months later, I had an ex coworker reach out and say, hey, guess what? They flipped the default. What do you mean they flipped the default? I'm, I'm used to working with legal corporate affairs. I'm used to working with you know, the vice president to say whether or not something could go open source. And now because of this, how open source is starting to catch on in developer division, that becomes a default. And now you have to have a reason not to be open source which kind of blows the mind, especially if you've seen that that only happened in a few years. Uh, just a fun little fact, I went and looked to see how TypeScript was doing these days, so kind of roll the clock forward a bit. And this is number five programming language on GitHub right now, which it's like more popular than C++ and Go and C Sharp in open source. So it's one in, one in five JavaScript projects by JavaScript developers and open source is now in TypeScript. So it's phenomenal. I definitely don't take credit for you know, all that growth. I'm just kind of a piece of that happening, but it was really awesome to be part of that. Okay, quick breath. So that was kind of the TypeScript side. Let's kind of switch and talk about the rest side. So like I said, I worked on the TypeScript project. I was like, oh, this is great. And even felt a bit confident that I could go in and do it again. Yeah, sure, no problem. Here we go, Rust project, here I come. So I come into the Rust project and I realize that it's already established. I can't just come in and start changing things. Um, you have a community that's small. It's healthy, but it's, it's pretty small. Um, but it has this established DNA, it has a way of doing things. They already do kind of a communal decision-making process, so you can't just you know, tell people what to do. Okay, all right, okay. And it's already good open source. It's on uh, liberally licensed, it's on GitHub, it already has contributors, it's doing um, really well in that regard. So as you can imagine, my first day, I got a lot of blank stares because I came in and said, all right, this is how Microsoft did it, wrote a bunch of stuff on the whiteboard, and they're like, cool story, bro. 
that, that's not going to work here. OK, all right. I will do something different. Um, I want to help, but I don't know how to help yet. So I had to figure that out. The first thing that Aaron Turan, who's the um, Rust lead at, at Mozilla, he sat me down and says, OK, we need more compiler engineers, so you're going to be a compiler engineer. I said, I haven't touched a compiler in about four plus years. I've just done like this really pointy haired boss, like TypeScript team thing. OK, I will, I will work on the compiler. So maybe I can take working on the compiler and I can work on the compiler in such a way that it improves something more generally, maybe. OK. So I reach out to the compiler team lead. I say, help. <laughs> I need a project to work on. He said, I have, I have a thought. Ah, uh, yes, which leads us to lesson six. But I'm going to show you this first. So he's like, you know, here are error messages today. Here's what they look like. And if you're used to Clang and GCC, that's not that bad. They're OK. You know, you can kind of squint. And if, you're, if you can parse a C++ template error, like that's nothing, right? <laughs> but he said, I have this idea. I kind of scribbled it one time. I didn't have time to look at it. And he kind of pulls it out and says, what if we just put their code and then label it and put like little things on the labels? I said, hey. Hey, I can do that. In fact, I can spend far too much time trying to perfect the perfect design for that. But it's, it's something I can do. So that's what we did. So we built these new error messages into the Rust compiler. And we put it behind a flag. We only switched a few error messages. But I was like, that's enough. I can take that and I can show people all and say, look, here are a new kind of error message. I hope you like it. And people really, really liked it. And so what I kind of took from that is I can create a lot of stress by coming into a situation and say, I have a lot of ideas. Everyone gather around the whiteboard. Here are my ideas. When they already have hundreds of people giving them ideas, or now thousands, that's, that's not going to work. But I can make a demo like the uh, all right, I'll, I'll change this error message to this new error message, and maybe I can get some momentum around people caring about usability. All right. As long as they can touch it and feel it, that might build momentum. So I start building this thing, and when you compile the, the Rust compiler, especially back then, it took about 45 minutes each time. It's like, this is going to take forever. There are so many error messages. I cannot do this myself. OK, Aaron, help me again. All right, so I did your compile thing. Now help me, like, how do I do all these error messages? It's going to take me forever. It's like, OK, there's a thing called a quest issue. And I'm like, what? <laughs> this is not a video game. Like, what is a quest issue? So, said, OK, here. Quest issue is where you have a blueprint. A blueprint that walks you through how to do thing. It's very detailed and very repeatable. OK. You know how to do the error messages. You've been working on them for a couple of weeks. Write the steps down, how to do it, A, B, C, D. And then people can come in. They can have confidence that they can do that fix. And then they can submit the PR. And then it lands in the compiler. And holy crap, I did that error message. So, oh, there's a lot of incentive there. OK. So I was like, OK, maybe we'll get a dozen people. A dozen's a lot. I'll take a dozen. So I, I worked with um, uh, some folks, wrote the documentation, put the documentation up there, and then let people start signing up for it. And uh, yeah, a lot of people signed up for this. Lots of people. In fact, we had 85 people jump on and send us pull requests. Now, the interesting thing with doing the quest issue and having that in the back of your mind is that when the PRs come in from people that, you know, oh, OK, they followed the steps, but they missed one. Hey, you're the one who wrote the steps. You can quickly debug the PR, get them on the right track, and get a higher quality PR. The interesting thing about this group. So I started asking around, can you believe that 
for at least 10 of these people, this was their first contribution to open source ever. So if you have the steps and they can have confidence in this juicy idea of, oh, maybe I can land in the compiler itself and then I can use it, it's a, it's a good carrot. The other thing that this did was that as, um, as people came to it, you'd imagine most people would fall off. They submit the PR, they get it to land, yay, good for me, and then they would just leave. One or two people stuck around, and in fact, one of them is leading the error code, like the error message, continuous improvement, even today, years later. So they're still improving the error messages going forward. Being able to attract that kind of person and give them enough of an incentive to stay is awesome. So this leads us to kind of the next lesson as part of this, that we can do work in, say, ergonomics like we did with Rust and error messages, right? Updating an error message doesn't break Rust. It doesn't make it slower or anything. It just gives you a better error message. And then people can have a, a better expectation for how this works. If, uh, if we can do better error messages, maybe we can do faster compiles or maybe we can do better IDE. And it creates this sense that I can have nice things. I can have my cake and eat it too. And that's the kind of feeling that if users can feel that and then can suggest ways to make the project grow in that way, then we have a, a much better set of contributors. <clears throat> All right, so we have people coming on. They, uh, they can help out in some places. That's cool. But let's maybe roll back the clock a bit and see that there was, there was another, another thing where Rust needed to grow. Uh, I don't have it in this, um, in this chart. When I joined in March of 2016, I remember pulling Aaron aside and I said, okay, you've got it was something like seven sub-teams and you have seven people that work for you and each one of them is on six of these sub-teams. Like, this can't be good. Like, how is this sustainable? If you have to have one more sub-team, you're gonna have like three year team quit or something. Like, no, one's, no one can juggle that much. And um, this was a, a slow and steady uh, growth initially to kind of bring a new person on and then mentor them. But then it became worth it. They stuck around and they mentored the next person. And so maybe now your team isn't wearing six hats, they're wearing five or four. And the more that we can get them down to one, the better. This really started taking off because people realized, oh my gosh, Rust is cool. And also, I have a chance to be a part of a sub-team now. I didn't think I had a chance because I mean, I knew everyone's name, and they're in six different ones, and I don't have that much time. But now there's a slot available. They'll just take me in, they'll teach me how to do it, and now we can grow from that really tiny set of people to a much larger set. And uh, just like this graph shows, this really shot off as we were like, okay, we need a team that does release management because it's one person, it's Alex. For those of you who do Rust, Alex did everything back in the day. Um, we need a release management team. Then all of a sudden, all these DevOps people just kind of appeared. They're like, hey, I can do a thing. I, I can do DevOps, I can do that. And then you have, we went from zero to 12 people like overnight. Well, okay, I mean, if, and sure enough, they're good. You know, they know what they're talking about. They kind of sort it out and now they've got a release process. You make this space. Um, we're still trying to figure out some of these. I would love to get your feedback on how do you not spend two to four hours a day on, on PR code reviews, um, right? So there's still some pain points, but we're realizing that we have to be able to spread the load. We have to be able to mentor people. And then as we grow, um, that then has to be able to be another set of um, mentoring that happens. This less, last lesson is one that I could probably talk all day about. This is really tricky, and I'm gonna do my best to unpack it in a couple of minutes. If you look at a project of people, you know, the, the contributors, the users, the kind of the founders, they're working together. And if the founders say, you know what, <laughs> you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna add, uh, 
uh, I don't know, we'll just add this backdoor into it. Or we'll add a new feature that connects to a proprietary cloud service, right? We're gonna do telemetry and then we're gonna track you on your computer. Okay, those are extreme examples, but you can think of plenty of examples of where a decision was made by you know, the, the management, even in an open source sense, like the owners of the project, they make a decision and people panic. Like, what are you doing? Why wasn't I consulted about that? Like, don't you, don't you care about my opinion? Like, don't you care that I'm a user, that I contribute to your project? So there's, um, there's something that uh, Dave Herman, which is a good friend of mine, uh, likes to bang on about. And he says, like, why wasn't I consulted is how you do open source. You bring the decision-making process out from behind closed doors and put it in front of people. Like every decision you make, if it's gonna affect um, you know, the project, needs to be discussed and needs to be uh, decided as a group. Rust has really embraced this. You know, it's kind of stumbled here and there, but the, the RFC process allows even decisions about the, the next year of stuff that we do or the next three years of stuff that we do to be talked about publicly and for people to decide, okay, yes, that sounds good. And they generally nod and they go off in this direction and now they have ownership in that direction. It's not just the owners decided, okay, that sounds good. Let's go off in this direction and then uh, leave everyone behind. This ownership, I kind of alluded to this with spreading the load, but if people feel like their opinions don't matter, then they don't contribute as hard. They don't work as hard to succeed. And in Rust, the, the kind of community that they want to build is a lot of people that care a lot and that own a lot of the Rust project so that as Rust grows, they continue to push and they continue to recruit more people um, as part of that. We want that shared ownership of those wins and losses. If we make mistakes, let's own the mistake, correct it, and then move forward. Rust, um, I did the same thing that I did on the TypeScript side. Uh, Rust is looking pretty good. So that research language that we kind of saw in 2016 has then grown, built a much larger subteam to support it, and now also has a, has a nice list of people that are using it. The Microsofts and Google and Facebook all have some interesting projects in Rust. Um, I put Canonical, CoreOS, System76. Um, if you use System76, I think as you boot, you're like already using Rust. So it's, it's a cool uh, project, but it also is finding that the set of users, commercial users that are using it for real and real projects. And Rust has also continued to grow in the um, list of programming languages on GitHub. It's now number 13, up from number 15 a few months ago and then up from number 40, you know, a couple years ago. So it's, it's really starting to take off. Do a quick uh, summary slide if anyone wants to take a picture to kind of get a, a sense um, for some of the stuff we talked about. And with that, I'll open it up for questions.